You're listening to the Hayek Program Podcast. This podcast includes audio from lectures, interviews, and discussions from scholars and visitors of the F.A. Hayek Program for Advanced Study in Philosophy, Politics, and Economics at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. To learn more about the Hayek Program, visit ppe.mercatus.org. So I'm uh, very glad uh, to be here. I'm glad Professor Kirzner was here last night so that I'm not the oldest member of the faculty. <laughs> but if you want to reminisce about the 70s with me, I'm ready. Um, I thank Bruce for uh, his talk and especially the fact that he didn't feel the need to take the entire 90 minutes, so I may uh, follow that precedent. Unfortunately, he felt the need to be interesting. I'm not sure I'll be able to <laughs> follow that. Um, so uh, Virgil told us that there are three purposes here. I wish I'd known that ahead of time, but uh, the first is it's a career pep talk. And I can do that. I hadn't really prepared anything along those lines. Uh, second, uh, maybe provide you with some tools. That's what I'm prepared to do. And then uh, talk about where the action is research-wise, and I have a little bit to say about that. So I want to talk about uh, modern Hayekian macroeconomics. And it's going to be a combination of old school Hayekian macroeconomics and what's being done to bring it up to date. And then uh, applications, new applications and extensions when I get to the end of it. So here's putting it in the context of the history of economic thought. <laughs> so there used to be three schools of thought in uh, macroeconomics or business cycle theory as it used to be known. Writers who focused on the problem of a mismatch between savings and investment, the importance of capital and the interest rate being right. So that tradition comes out of Bombaverk and especially out of Vixel, who kind of restates Bombaverk in more rigorous form. Bombaverk is kind of a loose thinker on some things. Uh, and from Vixel, you get the Swedes, you get the Vienna School. And early on, he has some followers in Cambridge, like Dennis Robertson and Keynes of the treatise on money. Uh, Keynes doesn't do a very good job of it, and so he changes his mind about how to approach macro, but that's another story. Uh, you've got an underconsumption school, which is not very prominent. It's kind of looked down on by legitimate uh, economists. Uh, J.A. Hobson's the biggest proponent, but it's revived by Keynes in the general theory. Uh, and then you've got the quantity theory tradition, associated with Irving Fisher, which is revived by Friedman and the Monetarist School. And then there's general equilibrium theory, but I've got it in parentheses because nobody thought of it as a business cycle theory or a way of doing business cycle theory. Hayek did talk about the relationship of business cycle theory to general equilibrium theory. He said we ought to try to make it consistent. And what he meant by that was we should start with an economy in equilibrium, subject it to a shock, and see what happens and how it returns over time to equilibrium. And that idea is picked up by Lucas and sort of made into a methodological statement for new classical economics. But in Lucas, adopting general equilibrium methods means at every point markets have to be clearing, otherwise you don't know how to solve your model. <laughs> it's sort of part of the solution set that markets, uh, prices are clearing markets interest rate is clearing intertemporal market. So the person who's done most since South Royalton to restate and extend and clean up inconsistencies uh, in the Mises Hayek story is Roger Garrison. And so I'm going to take some diagrams from his book as a way of spelling out what the theory is. But it's in diagrams, right? It's not in equations, and it's not in some other method, <laughs> uh, because it's, it's hard to write out a closed form algebraic version of the theory. If somebody could do that, that'd be great. But there are, uh, Garrison wants to tell a kind of dynamic story, and he wants to tell it in the context, or following Hayek, tell it in the context of an economy that has more margins of choice than the standard model. And in particular, there's a margin of choice about how roundabout to make production. And it's hard to 
solve those kind of models uh, algebraically except in a stationary state. And in a stationary state, you can't have business cycles. So that's no good. There's been a revival of the old Keynesian general theory by Krugman. Talking about the 70s again. <laughs> I lived through this in, uh, when I was in college, people actually believing in C plus I plus G. And then uh, I was an undergraduate at Harvard. They still believed it. I had read uh, Man, Economy, and State, so I knew it was all defunct, but apparently they hadn't gotten the message yet. <laughs> but then I got to UCLA for graduate school, and they had gotten the message. They knew it was all defunct. Uh, and I thought it was all dead. We weren't going to talk about fiscal policy anymore. We weren't going to talk about multipliers anymore. Uh, but then Krugman brings it back in the last financial crisis. All right, he's got a book entitled, End This Depression Now. How do you end the depression now if the depression has something to do with wasted capital during the boom? No, that's not part of his story. It's just insufficient demand. So all you got to do is crank up demand, which is the sort of basic Keynesian story back from the 30s. Uh, but you've got, of course, newer developments, new Keynesian models where there is a kind of a disequilibrium story where price stickiness is what's preventing the market from getting to it, back to its general equilibrium configuration. And so you have this kind of strange situation where in a choice between the new Keynesians with price stickiness and out of equilibrium dynamics, it's a charitable way to interpret what they're doing, and the new classical model where it's equilibrium always, you find Austrian sympathizers like Leland Jaeger saying, well, these guys are more reasonable, actually, than these guys. <laughs> Even though I'm a monetarist, they're taking it to the extreme that Friedman never did. But there's kind of a clash between the new Keynesians and the new classicals who want to say it's not about price stickiness. In, in Lucas, you have this affinity with Hayek that he picks up on. Lucas quotes Hayek, and later on he sort of backtracks and says, well, I thought I was doing something Hayekian, but I've been convinced that I was just misreading Hayek. I don't think he was entirely misreading Hayek. I think there is some affinity to it. He's got a monetary shock model. It works through misperceptions of prices. It doesn't work through the interest rate. But he pretty much gives it up when he starts reading Prescott. And Kidlin and Prescott convince him that you can build a model that mimics the property of properties of post-war business cycles without monetary shocks playing any role. It's just real shocks, right? So a so-called real business cycle model captures the time series. And this is kind of a new way of testing, if you want to call it that, a model, which is you build a little toy economy, you calibrate the parameters so that they're kind of reasonably close to what you see in cross-sectional studies like labor market, labor leisure substitution, and interest rate sensitivity of investment, and things like that. And then you simulate it. So you try to get it to produce co-movement in the variables that empirically co-move over the cycle, and then have about the right amplitude. Uh, and then you call that, I don't want to say verification, but the, the, the model passes the test if it can do those things. Of course, you're leaving out all kinds of other phenomena that uh, you're abstracting from. But if, it, if you can get it to mimic the time series that you want it to mimic, then that's a success. And so Lucas says, oh, okay, you got me. You've convinced me that monetary shocks are not important for that period. But this period is kind of bookmarked now. So Lucas continues to say, you can't explain the Great Depression without monetary shocks. And you can't explain the Great Recession now without monetary shocks. But it's not a boom-bust theory. It's just a negative monetary shock the economy takes a while to recover from, right? which is Friedman's position, too. There's no boom. There's just collapses and recoveries. So there's been a kind of convergence of methods between all these people building Valrasian models on the dynamic stochastic general equilibrium approach. So it's not just one model. It's a whole family of models, and you can build more price stickiness in or less price stickiness in, and that's what they argue about.
and the big names here are Woodford, Taylor, Calvo, Michael Woodford, John Taylor, Guillermo Calvo. If there's a Nobel Prize for the DSGE, which is less likely after the financial crisis, but because <laughs> they can't explain the financial crisis unless you really tinker with it a lot, put in a financial sector, for example, that's who would get it. So one of the things I'm going to talk about is whether there's any shred of Austrian ideas in this way of approaching macroeconomics. Well, here's Calvo, just a couple of years ago, 2013. So this is a, an opening, I think. The financial crisis has convinced some thoughtful proponents or people who actually work with these models, the DSGE models, that they were missing something. Uh, so Calvo puts this paper in the Bank of Japan Monetary and Economic Studies. I forget what the main title was, but he's got a section entitled The Austrian School of the Trade Cycle Was on the Right Track. And he actually has read it. He's actually read Mises and Hayek, which is, there are several authors who want to talk about credit cycles who will cite Hayek, and then they'll cite Minsky. <laughs> and it's really just sort of a courtesy citation. Okay, there are these other people who talked about credit cycles. But it's not really driving what they're saying. Uh, but Calvo's actually dug into it, and he actually understands the distinction between Mises and Hayek on business cycles. But he says, I, I want to argue that the Austrian school offered valuable insights disregarded by mainstream macro theory without resorting to irrationality. Overextension of credit was at center stage. But authors differed as to the factors responsible for excessive credit creation. Mises attributed it to central banks' propensity to keep interest rates low. Hayek, on the other hand, he goes on to say, and I'll talk about this aspect of Hayek later, Hayek blames it on endogenous overenthusiasm by the commercial banks, so not blaming the central bank. And that's, it's true that is one scenario that Hayek entertains. It's not the entire picture, and it's actually not central to Hayek's argument, but it is part of Hayek's argument. So Calvo, after... Uh, after saying that, Calvo concludes, whatever you think of the power of, the, of a mix of between the two, partly we blame the central bank, partly we blame the commercial banking system uh, as a positive theory. An insight from the theory is that once credit over expansion hits the real sector, rolling back credit is unlikely to be able to put Humpty Dumpty together again. All right? So he's saying not only does this theory help explain why the boom collapsed, but why the recession is difficult to resolve is difficult to overcome. You're going to have real misallocations that have to be corrected. So I think this is an opportunity to uh, get a somewhat sympathetic hearing if you can get your paper sent to Calvo as a referee, I guess. Uh, of course, this is an invited paper. It's not clear it would have survived the refereeing process at uh, <laughs> a mainstream journal. So let me talk about to a high extent three scenarios of the business cycle. And the first one is also Mises' scenario. And this is the one you sort of usually get when you hear a quick explanation of Austrian business cycle theory. So here's the loanable funds market where the interest rate is determined. Uh, here's the initial equilibrium. Everything's cool. Supply and demand for credit are in equilibrium. But now the central bank decides to cheapen credit, lower the interest rate, and they do that by expanding money supply. So they expand the monetary base. The banks take that and expand M1 and M2. Just keeping the same reserve ratio leads to expansion in bank-issued money. Uh, and now you've got an interest rate temporarily clearing the market that is below the natural rate. Excel would have called the natural rate, the rate that equates demand for investment with voluntary savings. So this is a kind of involuntary savings, or as Hayek called it, forced savings, uh, which really means it's demand from, uh, it's satisfying demand from investors without people being actually willing to forego consumption. So this is going to create a mismatch between the plans of investors who now want to invest more and the plans of savers who don't want to save more. In fact, at a lower interest rate, the quantity saved will be less. Uh, so that's going to set up the discoordination that's going to work through as the business cycle. 
Uh, but here's scenario two, which I think is probably more relevant, uh, probably more often the case, and I think was the case in uh, the most recent boom and bust, but arguably was also the case in the 20s. And it's the case that Vixel talks most about. So first, what happens is not the central bank acting out of the blue, but investors discover new investment opportunities and they want to invest more. So there's technological change. Right? So there is a real factor that matters here. So in the 20s, there were lots of new industries. Households were being electrified, automobiles were being sold to everybody. Lots of changes, lots of things to invest in. Uh, they go to the banks and, so here's the shift in the demand curve for loanable funds. From the initial interest rate, they would drive up the interest rate if nothing happened to the supply of credit, if you were still on the same supply curve for loanable funds. And that would be cool. The way Hayek puts it is the, the natural interest rate break in the economy would ration the actually available supply of savings to the highest payoff projects. You wouldn't get too many projects being financed. But suppose the central bank thinks that it's their job to make sure that there's enough credit to meet the needs of trade. This is a phrase used by uh, the Real Bills Doctrine people, who in fact were running the Fed in the 1920s. So now you've got an interest rate here, which is the same as the old interest rate. So if you're just looking at interest rates, you don't see any real signal that things have changed. But as an entrepreneur who was, went to the bank and looked to borrow money, all you see is your loan got approved. And OK, now we can invest. But again, there's a mismatch between the amount of investment that's being undertaken and the amount that could be financed with voluntary savings. All right, so the way Garrison likes to put it is the supply of loanable funds is being padded by the central bank's intervention. And then you have to sort of hear a lecture by Garrison to appreciate his <laughs> folksy-isms, but the economy bites off more than it can chew. And in the next diagrams, I'll show you where the economy chokes. <laughs> right, but it's trying to in engage in more investment than uh, is consistent with the plans of the people who need to finance it, the savers. All right, so the central bank is over-accommodating the increase in demand for credit. So what's characteristic of an investment boom is not a drop in interest rates preceding it, but the interest rate failing to rise when it should. And in Hayek's a Nobel Prize lecture, he says, the problem with this theory from the standpoint of the positivists in the economics profession is that it's appealing to an unobservable, which is the natural rate has risen, but you can't see that in any direct way. Nonetheless, I think it's the right picture, whereas focusing on the measurable aggregates the way Keynesians do gives you a misleading picture. Okay, so Policy uh, implication, you should let the interest rate rise when demand for loanable funds rises. Now, this is hard for central banks to do if they conceive of their policy as hitting an interest rate target, because to let the natural rate rise, they have to change their interest rate target. So they have to be uh, able to perceive when it's necessary to raise the interest rate target. Uh, what the real bu Bill's Doctrine taught, and what Greenspan and Bernanke did in the 2000s was, no, as the economy starts to recover or as demand for loanable funds rises, keep interest rates low by injecting credit. There would have been an increase in investment without the central bank intervening, but they feed it such that the increase in investment goes too far. Right? So the <laughs> one thing he wrote recently, Roger said that the uh, the overexpansion piggybacks on the genuine uh, investment boom in the economy. And then we got into a debate about whether piggyback was really the metaphor he wanted. <laughs> Here's Hayek's third business cycle scenario. It looks just like the last one. But here, the shift outward in the supply of loanable funds is coming from the commercial banks instead of from the central bank. So it's not an increase in the monetary base. It's an increase in the money multiplier, you could say. The amount of deposits banks and loans banks create from a given amount of reserves. And 
In uh, prices and production, Hayek has uh, some arguments as to why this might happen. I'll get to them in a second. But he comes back to this theme in uh, Constitution of Liberty. There's one chapter on monetary uh, issues. And the way he puts it there is all money at all times, I mean, those are his words, and I read that as doesn't matter what institutional arrangements you have for supplying money, which, of course, in a way, he takes back when he writes denationalization of money, is a loose joint in the otherwise self-steering mechanism of the market, right? So a loose joint means a factor that can be driven off course, doesn't always follow the fundamentals in the economy. So this, I think, is an interesting proposition and a debatable proposition and where some of the debate needs to be. One way to think about the theory of free banking is that it's trying to argue that if you look into the actual mechanisms by which banks supply money, it's pretty tight. <laughs> banks are optimizing. They're not doing crazy stuff. You should think that evolution should favor or survival of the fittest should favor banks that are not acting like loose joints. And so it does matter what kind of institutional arrangements you have, because central banks can survive doing all kinds of crazy stuff. Right? They don't go out of business. So does this scenario make sense? Here's what Hayek says, bank in a competitive environment, which first feels the effect of an increased demand for credits, so that's the demand for loanable funds shifting out, cannot afford to reply by putting up its interest charges. Yeah, I think that's wrong. I think they can't afford not to. For it would risk losing its best customers to other banks. The bank will be forced to satisfy the increased loan demand even at the cost of reducing their liquidity. Yeah, that doesn't make sense to me, right? If you're a firm and you're producing at rising marginal cost, and he recognizes that there's a cost of extending credit, which is you get less liquid as a bank, you run your reserve ratio down, you're taking a risk that could cost you. But in general, if you're a firm producing at a rising marginal cost and demand goes up, you do raise your price because you don't want to supply everybody who wants it at the old price. You can't afford to. Your costs of production are going up. You can only produce the old quantity at the old price. You need a higher price to want to produce a higher quantity. So likewise, banks do want to lay, raise their loan rate get rid of some of the customers who don't want to pay the higher rate. And to say that they can't do it because they would lose customers to other banks, well, that's a paradox you have in any industry. But in this case, the bank, like in any other industry, the bank can satisfy all the customers it's getting at a higher price, all the customers it wants to satisfy at a higher price. So why should it hesitate to raise the price? If nobody else raises their price, great, then all the excess demand comes to me. But the mechanism here is a little strange. It would lose, risk losing its best customers to the other banks. Okay, so the bank can distinguish between best customers and worst customers. So why isn't it charging different rates to the different customers? If the other banks can do that, right, peel off your best customers by offering them a better rate than you are, then you can do the same thing. I don't quite understand why the other banks know which are your best customers, but you don't. Okay. So I've got a piece in 1999 called uh, Hayek's Monetary Theory and Policy, a Critical Reconstruction, in which I take him to task for this. It's mostly you know, a positive review of what Hayek's saying, but I try to find the flaws in it too. And in general, that's the way you should approach <laughs> the masters. And so the people at the Mises Institute who like to divide everybody between Mises, Misesians and Hayekians are making a mistake when they put me in the Hayekian box, because on this issue, Mises is right and Hayek is wrong. But here's the bigger, sort of bigger picture. Uh, so I've, I've talked about how Vixel leads to Mises and Hayek, but before Vixel, there's the 19th century debates over whether the Bank of England is causing business cycles. And the people who say it is are Torrens of the currency, for example, Torrens of the currency school. Not everybody in the currency school, but Torrens was good on this. Uh, a guy named James William Gilbart from a group I call the Free Banking School. And Mises sometimes says, what I'm trying to do in spelling out the Austrian, what's been called the Austrian business cycle theory, is insights I'm 
getting from the currency school and from Vixel. He wasn't quite as self-effacing as Kirshner was last night. <laughs> but he gave credit to those uh, sources. And then you can think of Hayek's contribution as making a lot more explicit what was in Mises' story about changes in the structure of production, which we'll talk about now. So the, the presumption in the, their business cycle theory is what needs to be explained is a boom-bust pattern. Why does the boom give way to a bust? So this is from a paper by Lucas. He's fitted a trend. It's a kind of wavy trend, so it's some kind of higher order polynomial trend. I don't know exactly what he did. But it's not my fitting, so that's why you can trust it. And there's a long boom period. And you might say, well, that's pretty small. Yeah, but look at all the other cycles. It's pretty big compared to all the other cycles. That's a pretty big deviation. And it's followed by a collapse and this deep depression. So sort of the key question is, why can't the boom last? Now, there are some particular things about the Great Depression. And you can see how big the Great Depression is compared to all other cycles. The Great Recession's off the chart here. First, the Great Depression, the depth of the Great Depression may not be completely explained by the collapse of the boom because it's disproportionate to the size of the boom in the first place. So there are other things we can introduce and this is sort of important ongoing research in economic history. What else helped prolong the Great Depression? Uh, bad fiscal policy, National Recovery Administration. Right, people at uh, Ohanian and Cole at UCLA have been doing work on that. Uh, bad w wage policy. Actually, a lot of the things that Rothbard talked about in America's Great Depression. So. That's, that's what I regard as the valuable part of America, great, America's Great Depression, not the part that suggests that there's no danger in the money supply collapsing, <laughs> because the closer we get to 100% reserves, the better. There's the Friedman and Schwartz story about the money supply collapsing, and I think that is part of the problem. There's an excess demand for money created. But anyway, I'm going to come back to the boom and bust. This blip, by the way, this is measurement error. <laughs> this is World War II. Prices are controlled. If you take nominal output and divide it by prices that are so low you can't actually buy stuff at those prices, you get a high measured real output. You can't actually buy it, <laughs> but it looks high. Uh, so here's the more recent cycle, and this is why Mises and Hayek have come back into the spotlight. Now, this line I did fit myself, so maybe you shouldn't trust it, but it sure looks to me like a prolonged boom followed by a collapse and the notoriously slow recovery where we're sort of paralleling the old trend and not catching back up to it. Now, that's not the only place you can put a trend line. The way they do it when they estimate potential output in the economy is they move it so that it just touches the tops of the uh, expansion periods, and then 95% of the time the economy is underperforming. <laughs> And so therefore, although the Keynesian prescription, they say, is you know, symmetric and even, you should stimulate when the economy is below full employment or below potential, and then you should step on the brakes when the economy is overheating. The way they draw the potential output, the economy is overheating 95% of the time. Uh, sorry, underperforming 95% of the time, almost never overheating. So the people who actually estimate potential output have had a hard time with the fact that this gap is persistent. They've started to reduce potential output based mostly on labor force participation falling. But it seems to me to explain this sort of new path being below the old path, you need to refer to the fact that we wasted a lot of resources in the boom. Right? It's not just insufficient demand. There's a supply constraint. We got the wrong set of capital goods. So here's Mises and Hayek returning to uh, <laughs> the spotlight, at least on the internet. And these videos have like three million hits each. Uh, I also did a video for Econ Stories TV where I try to explain what Hayek is saying in the videos. That has about 3,000 hits, but <laughs> <laughs> feel free to add to it if you haven't watched it already. When I was out 
giving lectures promoting my book, The Clash of Economic Ideas, I used to say that uh, you need to read my book to understand really the depth of these <laughs> videos. And if all three million people who saw the videos would buy my book, that would be great. <laughs> So the outline, the sort of gross outline of the theory is probably familiar to you. It's a cheap credit policy, not necessarily out of the blue, either out of the blue or in response to an increased demand for credit, over amplifies the boom, well, either creates a boom where there wasn't going to be one or over amplifies the boom that was already going to be in investment. That creates unsustainability, that leads to crisis. That has to be followed by a restructuring and liquidation, as the term goes. Although it's become kind of a pejorative among Keynesians to call somebody a liquidationist, right? because that means they're insensitive to the widows and orphans. And the familiar analogy that you see in Wall Street Journal op-eds and so on is, it's like the economy feels great, like in the boom, like it feels great when you're binge drinking, which is defined on campuses now as what? When you have two beers? <laughs> uh, but it's going to be followed by a hangover. Even George W. Bush understood this uh, analogy. He was at a fundraiser, and he said to everybody, okay, turn off your cell phones, because I'm going to tell you why there's a financial crisis. And this is what he said, Wall Street got drunk, and now it has a hangover. Okay, so here's the, the sort of building blocks that Garrison appeals to, a trade-off between consumption and investment. And that may seem like basic Economics 101, that there's a production possibility frontier. Individuals out of their income can either consume it or save it, and you can't have investment unless people save. So there's a trade-off between consumption and investment. Yeah, that's not what you find in a Keynesian textbook. Right there it's C plus I plus G equals Y. Consumption and investment are complements or added to one another. And uh, investment doesn't depend on the level of savings. Investment is autonomous. And more savings doesn't encourage more investment. It just goes under the mattress. So right, this is actually uh, has a substantive, makes a difference. I mean, there are other ways of doing macro where this doesn't happen. Now, to, to give credit to uh, real business cycle theory, real business cycle theory is based on growth theory. And growth theory does have this trade-off. So it's so a slightly more solid foundation. Uh, so folksy example, you can either eat your corn or you can save it for investment. And of course, Ricardo is associated, especially by Mark Vlaug, with the corn model of the economy. Uh, so one good, and the question is, how much do you plant? OK, that's item number one. Item number two is the loanable funds diagram, which we've already seen. So an increase in voluntary saving, leave the central bank out of it for now, lowers the interest rate, but in a sustainable way. Now you can invest more because consumers really are willing to give up consumption for the time being. Presumably they're saving for something. So at some point they want a higher level of consumption. And the investment that's being financed here is going to make that possible. It's going to make capital formation and a higher level of income later on possible. So we can link the two diagrams. Here's the increase in investment on the horizontal axis being financed by an increase in saving. And you notice that the increase isn't quite as big as the shift in the curve because when you lower the interest rate, you discourage saving. The quantity saved on this new savings curve is less at the lower interest rate. But that's how supply and demand usually works. Anyway, increased investment shown here as the move from a mix which is relatively high on consumption to a mix that's higher on investment. Less consumption, more investment. All right, so corn that would have been eaten is moved into seed corn. And then here's the third element, which is probably the least popular <laughs> or the most controversial. All right, so there may be people in this audience who have said to me, just a few minutes ago, uh, this is fine and this is fine, but this is weird. <laughs> Not sure I buy this. Anyway, the stages of production, which is, uh, Garrison tips it over compared to the way Hayek had it, 
and it makes more sense this way. So time is going from left to right. If you take a sort of motion picture view, view of the structure of production, these are early stages of production. You dig out the raw materials, you refine them, you take them to the factory, you make stuff out of them, and here's consumption at this end. So that's the sort of time-lapse version of it, but you can also think of it as a snapshot of the economy at a point in time. The economy continues to produce the same goods each period, then at any point in time there are some goods ready for sale and some that are a year away from being ready for sale and so on and so forth, back to the earliest stages of production. It's a little bit weird that it comes to a point. It probably shouldn't. It probably should sort of just taper off because there's really no beginning. There are beginnings to current investment projects that are started today, but they aren't started without capital. They're started with inherited capital goods. Here's the diagram that's missing from prices in production, but it's important, and it's in Jack Hirschleifer's Interest Investment in Capital. And it comes out of a few people in the 50s who kind of rediscovered von Baverk and tried to make sense of it. This is just a simple comparative statics uh, effect of a change in the interest rate on the chosen roundaboutness of production. So roundaboutness means we got a choice about how long a production period to plan for. And suppose this line, this curve QQ, represents output at different dates. And the sort of easiest analogy is you plant a tree. And if you dig it up immediately, you've got a loss. But if you let it grow, at some point you recover your costs, and then it keeps growing, when do you want to chop it down? Well, you want to chop it down. You don't want to chop it down if it's growing faster than the market interest rate. But you do want to chop it down when it stops growing faster than the market interest rate, because then you could chop it down, sell it, put the money in the bank, and it would grow faster than the tree is growing. So at a high interest rate, you find the tangency with the growth curve, and that's your optimal harvest date. At a lower interest rate, let the tree grow a little longer, because at a lower interest rate, it's still growing faster than the market rate at point P star. Keep going till you reach P prime star. All right, so you plan for deeper capital, or you plan for more roundabout production, or longer investment periods at a lower interest rate. And that's what is going to get producers in trouble in the story where the interest rate is too low to sustain. So if people plan for output at P star, and before they get to P star, interest rates are higher, then they got to truncate the investment. Now, here the analogy to a growing tree doesn't really help us, because there's no crisis if you cut down a tree a year earlier than you expected. But in industrial production, if you've planned out an investment that won't come to fruition until date T, and now you find that it's going to be unprofitable if you wait until date T, it may not be salvageable. What you get when you truncate it early may not be consumable. All right? There may be things you have to add. This kind of production process is a point input, point output. But what you need for Hayek's theory is a continuous input so that there are still inputs left in this tree analogy. It's just, you know, sunshine and rain. Uh, but if you've got to process the stuff further to get it ready for consumers, then you have a hard problem. So it may pay to continue to finish the project even though you're going to lose money ex post, or you may abandon it. Uh, and so it's one of the things that Hayek wanted his theory to explain, he said, was what he called the typical 19th century crisis. And the typical 19th century crisis, you read about it, involved in the U.S., for example, half-built towns being abandoned. All right? So people were building new towns out on the frontier because interest rates were low and they thought everybody was going to move there. And then crisis, interest rate goes up, oh well. <laughs> and you would find these half-built cities just left there. And in the last crisis, we saw that in Las Vegas. I don't know if you ever have flown into Las Vegas. They've recovered since then, but in 2009, you fly into Las Vegas, 
and you could see neighborhoods where the streets had been laid and then no structures had been built, or the foundations had been dug and then nothing had been built on top of them. And in China, you've got entire cities where they've finished the buildings and nobody's moved in. Right? So I want to use housing as a kind of non-tree example. So here's the uh, ordinary length structure of production. Oh, I need to go back here. So at the uh, market clearing interest rate, you get a relatively short structure of production, which yields the consumption that people want. If you switch to more roundabout production, initially at least, it's going to reduce consumption. It's got to have a payoff later. It wouldn't be worth doing. But initially, it reduces consumption because more resources are going into investment. And in particular, they're going into early stages of production, which is what this diagram tells you. But it's going to be problematic if that interest rate is not an equilibrium interest rate that can persist. So here's a ordinary length structure of production. You've got bricks being produced in a very low-tech way in this picture. You, got, you take the bricks to the building site and you build a, build a brick hut. Here's the elongated structure of production. Now you've got fancy machines for producing bricks. Take the bricks to the construction site. You build something a little fancier than a hut. And I, I use the example of a two-story uh, brick building because I actually talked to somebody who was a real estate developer in the 70s when interest rates started spiking. And he said, look, we used to build two-story condos back when interest rates were low because we could afford to wait uh, to get our money back from the project. But when interest rates went up, re real interest rates, uh, we couldn't wait that long anymore. Money was, time was too valuable. We started building one-story <laughs> structures. Yeah, it took more land, but land was now cheaper than time. All right, so we changed our, in, this is my interpretation of what he was saying. <laughs> he didn't talk like a Hayekian. But <laughs> we changed the kind of projects we did based on the real interest rate. We went to quicker, dirtier projects, uh, get the money in and out faster because it's expensive to have a loan from the bank for much longer. Okay, so there are sort of examples and here I'm kind of cheating because I'm imagining that one person is overseeing the entire production process from beginning to end, but of course typically it's different firms and each firm is only making decisions about its segment of the market and what the guys producing bricks are responding to is not so much just the interest rate, but also the demand for bricks from the construction industry. But the construction industry is responding to the interest rate, right? Because at higher interest rates, people buy smaller houses. So this diagram I stole from Roger just because it's fun to watch. Watch the economy respond to an increase in savings. So this is the case in which the lengthening of the structure of production can be sustained. All right, so the supply curve of loanable funds shifts out, the interest rate comes down, more investment, less consumption to begin with, and a longer structure of production. And then there's one more element here, which is resources have to be pulled from early stages, sorry, from late stages to early stages to initiate the longer production processes. So in the early stage labor market, we've got wages rising. In the late stage labor market, we've got wages falling or not rising as much. All right, so workers are being pulled into early stages because, I mean, the simple way to think of it is the discounted value of their contribution has gone up because the discount rate has gone down. And there's a diagram in prices in production that illustrates that story this way. So at the high discount rate, which is a solid line, uh, the marginal product of labor, let's say, is, sorry, so here's the declining marginal product of labor at different quantities. It's really not worth investing in this early stage. But at a lower discount rate, which is the dotted line, now the curve starts up here. So at a given price of a given wage rate, now it pays to employ labor in the early stage. So these solid segments show you how much labor it pays to employ at different stages and 
at the uh, lower interest rate, the wage rate rises, that reduces the value, that reduces the number of workers who exceed, whose marginal product exceeds the wage rate in the early stages, because the di change in the discount rate hasn't affected things much here, hasn't changed the, where the discounted marginal product line begins. But in the earlier stages, the discounting effect swamps that. So even at a higher wage, you get it being worthwhile to move labor from late stages to early stages. Now, this is a pretty picture, once you understand it. <laughs> How much can you see this uh, empirically? I don't know. It seems to me that's a useful area for research. Do we actually see this kind of phenomenon? Do we see it secularly? All right, we've had a 30-year drop in real interest rates around the world. Do we see this kind of effect? Do we see it cyclically? Right? Is investment responsive enough over the course of the cycle to changes in interest rates uh, for you to see this pattern? All right, so that was the sustainable growth. If the central bank expands the supply of loanable funds, pads the supply of loanable funds, not with genuine savings, but with just created pieces of paper that enable investors to bid for resources, then you've got a boom and a bust. All right, so again, the interest rate falls and investors want to invest more. But problem here, genuine savings, savers want to save less, which means they want to consume more. So now the plans of consumers and the plans of investors are inconsistent. Together, they're overexhausting the possible combinations of consumption and investment. And if you sort of add together what investors want to invest, which is higher than before at the black dot, with what consumers now want to consume, which is higher, you get this point outside the production possibility frontier. So think of it as a kind of vector of forces. It's pointing to that point I've labeled boom. And this solid arrow is supposed to indicate the economy is being pulled that way. But at some point, it realizes investors realize they can't sustain these investments. Although the way uh, Roger has it drawn, consumption starts to drop before that's you know, peaking this way, and then investment falls. And not until you get well inside the production possibility frontier does investment go back down below where it started. Is that evident in the data? I actually gathered this consumption and investment data one time as for a comment on a presentation by Roger, and I found the curve going the other way. So I don't know a priori why consumption should peak before investment peaks, but anyway. Over here in the stages of production diagram, we've got the extended stages which shouldn't have been built, so that's malinvestment. And then we've got consumers trying to consume more because they don't want to save as much. That's overconsumption from the point of view of what's long run sustainable. And then you can see there's a lot of hand waving here. There's sort of a mess in the middle. <laughs> You can't have both of those things, so there's some kind of inner contradiction. But in, investors confront rising input prices, uh, and so that's when they abandon ship. Or they see interest rates rising because the central bank changes policy. Or the initial expansion just sort of runs out of juice as people adjust to it. Uh, it's what I just said. Uh, so a question that's often raised is, why are investors fooled by the low interest rate? And this question goes back to Lachman in the 40s. When they see the central bank lowering the interest rate, why don't they nudge one another and say, don't be fooled, old chap? Well, if the only time the interest rate fell was when the central bank was expanding, then yeah, they would be pretty foolish. So that's scenario one. For them to be fooled in a scenario one, it has to be the case that sometimes when the interest rate falls, it's genuine, and you lose profits by not responding to it. So there has to be what Lucas made famous as a signal extraction problem. Otherwise, that scenario doesn't make sense. So it can't be that every time the interest rate drops, it's because the central bank is doing it. It has to be sometimes it's a genuine increase in savings, or I guess a fall in loanable funds demand, but that's not going to set off an investment boom. 
But this is why I think scenario two is relevant. Scenario two, observing the interest rate doesn't tell you that there's an excess supply of credit. You can't infer it from that. Like I said, the, from the worm's eye perspective, all you see is my loan application was approved. Right? And it's unlikely that somebody whose loan application is approved is going to say, oh, wait a minute. <laughs> I know you're just trying to trap me here because that application shouldn't have been approved. Wouldn't have been approved unless credit was too cheap to last. So, no, no thank you. <laughs> I don't want to borrow money from a bank that wants to lend me money. <laughs> so I don't think we have a kind of rational expectations problem with scenario two. So what have we got in modern DSGE macro? So here's the quote from Lucas citing Hayek. And as I said, Lucas kind of gave up on that business cycle story, except for the Great Depression and the Great Recession. But it is still possible in DSGE models to talk about monetary shocks. It's not the common way of doing it, but it seems to me that, well, unless you have sticky prices. So if you have sticky prices, then tight money can have an effect. What's a little more challenging is trying to get a boom from overly loose money. Uh, in a model without capital, that's going to be hard to do. So, but, I mean, it's a flexible approach. The sort of workhorse, or sort of the, the standard exposition of DSGE models, you get three equations, an IS curve, a Taylor rule, and a Phillips curve, thank you. Yeah, something that goes from, from the price level to real output, from the inflation rate to real output because the three unknowns are the interest rate, the inflation rate, and the unemployment rate. Uh, or the, sorry, real output, the output gap. So maybe it can be inserted, and that's a useful exercise for somebody who's more tooled up than I am. But, so I looked through this literature, and there is a sort of methodological suggestion that is consistent with what Hayek said about how business cycle theory should proceed. Namely, you should start from equilibrium have your agents be guided by prices and then end in equilibrium. So it's not naive or uh, you know, hydraulic Keynesianism, at least we credit it with that. But the idea that people are responding to interest rate distortions in a, any serious way is not the usual story. All right, so it's either insufficient aggregate demand that's causing a recession or it's a real negative real shock. There's a kind of extreme aggregation in the standard version, there's one representative household. That kind of collapses market equilibrium to household equilibrium, which makes it hard to have a coordination failure. There's only one decision maker. Hard to think of them being out of whack with other decision makers. Uh, I guess the household would have to be schizophrenic or something. Uh, and as I said, the sort of general equilibrium methodology means that the prices that are in the solution set are going to clear all the markets. If you get some non-neutrality, it's due to sticky prices. Uh, but the sticky prices that attention is paid to are output prices and labor. Interest rates haven't been part of the story. Uh, there's an interesting paper by uh, Otmar Issing and a co-author. Issing was formerly a uh, member of the board of the ECB saying, you know, in these models, the households really seem to know implausibly much. Uh, and so we should pay attention to Hayek's critique of idealized agents who know too much. Uh, it applies not just to the central planner, but to the household in the DSGE model. If they're assumed to know the, the world they live in so well that they uh, have unbiased expectations. Right, so as Hayek said in, in 45, in the use of knowledge in society, to assume all the knowledge to be given to a single mind in the same manner in which we assume it to be given to us, the explaining economists. Well, that's what rational expectations models do with a single household, is to assume away the problem of knowledge acquisition and to disregard everything that's important and significant in the real world. So there's been some useful, interesting Austrian applied research on trying to understand the last boom and bust. I recommend Roger Koppel's uh, monograph published by the IEA. 
I mentioned this paper by Issing and Wieland in which they criticized DSGE models for committing the same mistake that Vixel made when he thought the interest rate could both clear the intertemporal market and keep the price level constant. In the Taylor rule, it's not just a constant price level, but keep the price level along the desired path and have the equilibrium real rate at the same time. So it would be interesting to uh, think about models that allow a discrepancy between those two rates, at least temporarily. And the, the idea of credit booms, which are not, had not been part of DSGE, has been rediscovered in particular by Claudio Borio at the Bank for International Settlements and William R. White, who used to be at BIS with Borio and is now at some other multinational agency. I forget which one. So those, it's not that they're explicitly Austrian, except that they do footnote Hayek. Uh, but somebody could, I think, build on the evidence they've amassed as to the importance of credit cycles to say, here's a way to understand these stylized facts. So uh, I did a paper which uh, David Beckworth sort of added some empirical analysis for me. Uh, one way to think about whether the interest rate is below equilibrium is to use the Taylor rule as a judge, right? So the Taylor rule says, here's what the Fed's interest rate target ought to be to keep to its inflation target. And Taylor makes this case himself. The period of the housing boom is a period in which the Fed funds rate was way below what it should have been. And then you have the collapse. So the shaded area is the recession. So I wrote something and just casually put it out there that this helps explain the housing boom. And Beckworth said, well, let's run a regression. And here's the scatter plot from the regression. And it's published in a paper under my name. <laughs> I said to Beckworth, really, you ought to be a co-author. This was in a book that he edited. And no, no. So <laughs> I have a footnote that says, really, this is Beckworth's work, but he won't take credit for it. <laughs> But uh, what this does, so each point represents a, so the vertical axis, sorry, represents a measure of the housing boom, ratio of house prices to rent or house prices to personal income. So sort of a measure of how far out of normal house prices are. Regressed against on the ver uh, horizontal axis, the discrepancy of the Fed funds rate from the Taylor rule recommendation. And there's a a positive correlation, uh, as I predicted. A <laughs> uh, sort of separate line of research is to ask, okay, if central banking was part of the problem, uh, how can we improve the outcomes? How can we get better monetary policy results? And, of course, there's a range of options that we can talk about, depending on how radical you want to be. Taking for granted that you have a central bank with a dual mandate, you could make the Taylor rule more of a binding rule. That is, compel the Fed to uh, adhere to a formula for adjusting the Fed funds rate. Of course, first we have to get back into a situation where the Fed funds rate means something. Right? After quantitative easing, banks don't lend each other funds anymore. They, they're all awash in excess reserves. Uh, but supposing you could get back to normal, you could think about imposing the Taylor rule. And the Taylor rule has both the inflation rate and the output gap in it. So in that sense, it satisfies the dual mandate. Uh, or you could think about the results of changing from a dual mandate to a single mandate. So a lot of central banks just have an inflation target. They have no responsibility for unemployment. So that's a single mandate. Uh, but it not, doesn't need to be the price level in the target. It could be nominal GDP. And, of course, Scott Sumner and David Beckworth and others have talked about why it's better. Um, and so I think those kind of discussions can use an Austrian perspective. But if you're willing to think about an alternative arrangement without a fiat money issued by a central bank, uh, I think there's room for research, renewed research on how commodity standards work. 
And to, to move to a commodity standard, all you have to do is reverse the quantitative easing so that the monetary base is small again, redeem the monetary base for gold, reprivatize the clearing system, reallow private note issue, and retire the FOMC. So, <laughs> uh, of course, it would be nice if you get other countries to do it at the same time, because gold works better as an international standard. But uh, so I have a recent paper entitled the merits and feasibility of returning to a commodity standard. Fe by feasibility, I mean there really is enough gold uh, to redeem the monetary base, assuming there is in Fort Knox what they say there is. Let me end on this note. There are other empirical techniques, or theoretical techniques, I should say, that we could think about exploring. And one is uh, agent-based models. Uh, it's kind of a attractive alternative to a one-agent economy <laughs> that we try to uh, simulate. Instead, we can try to simulate a million-agent economy. We've got the computer techniques uh, and muscle to do now. Um, so there are examples of you know, million-agent economies that have been studied. And so we can ask, uh, can we structure it these agents in such a way that they interact uh, kind of as an input-output system. So one firm is buying inputs from another firm and selling outputs to another firm or to consumers. And of course, firms are buying labor from households. And then ask, can we recreate, can we get it to perform like a macroeconomy in the sense that we have the co-movements among the aggregates that uh, DSGE models and real business cycle models are, pr are producing. Can we recreate Austrian cycle dynamics? It's hard to get, as I've been saying, Austrian cycle dynamics in DSGE models or in ISLM models. And Dick Wagner's been making this point for several years now. You can't get a coordination failure in a model with one agent. Randy Holcomb has a recent paper in which he says, you know, People complain about the idea of malinvestment that investors shouldn't be so easy to fool, but they think that all the investor has to observe is the market interest rate in order not to be fooled. But in fact, investors are responding to the prices being offered for what they're selling, right? which is maybe very indirectly reflecting what's happening to interest rates. So just observing interest rates or just observing monetary policy uh, isn't enough for them to be able to discriminate between increases in demand for their product, which they ought to meet, and those which they shouldn't meet. Uh, so maybe that can be captured in this kind of model where we give agents sort of reasonable computation capabilities and reasonable access to data. Kind of along the lines that McBride investigated, we could ask, is free banking robust? Uh, or does Hayek's scenario three emerge out of the dynamics of firms interacting? Are, is there a reasonable story about why banks would overexpand in response to an increase in demand for loanable funds? So I don't want to rule that out a priori, but we would need a better story about why that happens. We could contrast different monetary rules, right? Interest rate targets, nominal income targets, price level targets, and see how these kind of economies behave. So I look forward to work in this <laughs> direction. And let me uh, take questions. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Hayek Program Podcast. To learn more about the research, scholars, and work of the F.A. Hayek Program, visit ppe.mercatus.org.